invite you to join us for the morning worship service of Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church. We welcome you as we worship the Lord together. Thank you. Great job. Welcome home to camp meeting. It's great. Boy, this is just a wonderful time in August where we uh, spend some time with, with uh, this style of worship. Throw down some sawdust, turn the heat up, let some gnats go. It would be great, wouldn't it? But it's fun to be in this, uh, is this setting as well. Good to see each and every one of you here. Some of you are guests today. This is your first time at Trinity on the Hill. You are especially welcome, and we hope you realize that. We ask you to follow the good example of every member. You have a welcome folder on your pew there. If you'll sign in for us, we would appreciate that very much. If you ever have questions about what we do here at this church, we'd like to answer those, so feel free to contact us, especially if you're interested in joining this body of believers to serve Christ here. This is a great place to actually do that. You know, there's, uh, there's, we're bombarded all the time by commercials and things that are happening on TV. And we're, ex we're excited to say as Trinity on the Hill, we've kind of launched into that ourselves. We'll be uh, having some commercials on TV. And uh, it'll be uh, Thursdays and Fridays and early in the morning. I know you want to set your DVR for that. Make sure that you get to see it. But uh, just to kind of give you a taste of what it's like, we're going to run that commercial for you right now, and then we'll worship in spirit and truth. Welcome home. Welcome home. We want this to be a place where you can come and experience the grace of Christ and the transformation that that grace has. If you're looking for a place free of hypocrites, uh, you'll never find it in this world. We ask people to join us as we confess our flaws, our sin, and ask Christ to transform us, change us, and to lead us to a better way. Just come and experience for yourself, and uh, then you can go and tell. It's great to be home. Well, it's that time of year again. Camp meeting, some of you love it. Uh, do you want to be revived? Do you want to be revived? You know, you got to want it for it to happen. And hopefully, maybe by the end of the month, if you don't want it today, maybe by the end of the month, you'll want to be revived. Uh, singing helps your soul, your spirit come alive. It's amazing what a wonderful tool God has given us in singing. And an old, crusty, dead soul, when it starts to sing, things start to happen. Amen? Amen. Let's stand and make that happen. Revive us again. the women to sing the hallelujahs and all the men sing the response. 
Thine the glory, amen, thine the glory. Did we all come back together like the choir did on Revive Us Again? Sing it out on that second verse. We pray. going to sing it again without the piano because in the brush arbor days there was no piano they sang without any instruments so we're on our own like the old days ladies on that chorus hallelujah are you ready hallelujah by the glory So, do you feel it happening? Are you getting revived? All right, I love this next song. Jesus saves. I don't know what's going on back here, but. Uh, it, yeah, it's worrying me, but we're going to keep going here. No, I'm glad to know somebody is getting revived. That's good. I can remember going to Macon, Georgia as a child and going down to the inner city area or driving through it and seeing this big neon sign that said, Jesus saves. It was so awesome. And, um, you know, it seems corny, it seems, but in reality, it's what it's all about. Amen? Amen. So let's sing it. We have heard the joyful sound. me carefully now. Give the wind. Amen. You may be seated. That's great singing. As we go into our prayer time, just love these words. There is a place of quiet rest. I was sitting on my little porch this morning, and I always try to go through the bulletin and get my heart ready, and it just struck me how powerful all of these hymns are and how I've sung these all my life. Some of you haven't, but there are other hymns you've sung all your life, and we just take them for granted, and we don't focus. Take this home. Use it in your quiet time all through the week. 
focus on the beauty and the meaning of all of these words. There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. This needler is open if any would like to come. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this place, this place where we can find quiet rest, this place where we can find comfort near, near to your heart, Lord Jesus, blessed Redeemer, our good, good Father. How we thank you and how we praise you and worship you this day as we just stop, as we stop in the midst of our craziness of our lives, and as we still our souls and our minds and our hearts, to just be still and to listen, to listen for your still small voice that is still speaking to us today that we would know that you are God, that you are faithful, and that you so desire for our hearts to draw near to you. Thank you that you are here, that you are with us, that you never leave us, you never forsake us. And so, Lord, forgive us when we, even now, find our minds and our hearts wandering away from you. Lord, help us to focus our hearts and our minds and our souls only on you. For you are the one true God and how we love you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for loving us and for desiring the best for us. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your one and only son, Jesus, that we might have life and life eternally and life abundantly filled with joy. Help us to keep singing your songs boldly and proclaiming your goodness and your kindness that you so so pour upon us. Thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that directs our paths. Lord, keep our eyes so fixed on you that we would know your hope and that we would persevere in whatever ways that you need us to persevere in. And Lord, this day we especially pray for the beginning of new ministries, new school years, new seasons of life, that we might all be bold and courageous in sharing the gospel in the many places that you take us, Lord. Revive us again. Revive us and renew us. Create in us a burning in our souls, a fire that we cannot get away from, so that we will love you more 
that we would walk in all your ways and we would hold fast to you and you alone and that the world might see the Christ in us, the hope of glory. As we pray together the prayer you taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before Danny comes and leads us in our next hymn, I wanted to be sure that you understand how we're going to process through our blessing of the students and the teachers. When we get to the chorus of this next uh, song, I want all the teachers, administrators, bus drivers, cafeteria workers, custodians, secretaries, you name it, if you're involved in our schools anywhere from preschool up to college, we want to pray for you as your church. So as we get to the chorus, you come on down and just kneel at the altar, and we're going to be praying for you. The staff will be uh, touching you lightly on the shoulders for that personal touch. I'll be leading the prayer, and, I'll, and of course the congregation will be praying for you as well. When we finish with you, it'll be time for the greeting, and so we'll ask that the administrators will all go back to their seats, greeting folks as they go along the way. And then at the greeting, we want all the students to come forward. That's preschool students all the way up through college students so that we can have a time to pray for you. We have a special gift for you uh, that I'll explain when we get to that point. Again, the staff will be there to uh, help you along the way, and uh, Roy will be offering that prayer blessings for us as we uh, finish up the blessing. So that is a tremendous moment in the life of this church to be able to pray for this many people on a specific task of raising our children. So Danny, if you'll come and lead us in the song. Oh, how I love Jesus. Let's stand as we sing. Do you mean it? Sing it like you mean it. will be seated. We have our teachers and administrators and workers in the schools. Staff is there to lay hands upon you as we pray. Congregation, these are our people. 
these are our missionaries who will be playing an important role in children's lives children from the ages of two right on up until the age of 22 or more let us pray together gracious and holy god we want to thank you for these men and women who have come forward to be prayed for for they have chosen a a vocation that is so important to the life of the world to the life of our children some of these people have been called into this ministry from very young others have discovered this path only lately but have taken that path so seriously we pray today father that you will use all of their gifts and talents that you've given them that you will help them to use the skills that they've developed over the years so that they might bring glory to your kingdom by touching the life of a student, a young child or, or a college age student. Father, we pray that you would give them perseverance because sometimes it seems as if the task is too much or that we're not making a difference. Oh Lord, give them discernment to know that they do make a difference. We pray, Father, for their witness and their testimony that sometimes they can express openly and clearly and other times are not able to do so. So take their lives and make it that witness so that a student finds hope, sees clarity in their spiritual lives through these men and women's lives. Protect them, Lord, as they go along their way. Help them to be bold and courageous in this witness, in this testimony of their lives. And Lord, we just pray that this will be a good year for them, a banner year, as they teach our children, as they watch over our children in the school systems around us. Father, we pray this in your holy name because your disciples called you teacher. And so we look to you now as our example to teach the students of this day. We pray this in the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, Amen. Will you give them applause and encouragement? At this time, I'd ask for us all to stand and greet one another and allowing all the students to come forward, from the young students to the college students. God bless you and thank you for watching this broadcast today. Jimmy Barnett's one of our stellar teachers in the public school system. What, what do you look forward to this year the most as you are going to confront these students and all that they do? I believe making a difference in their lives. Yeah. It, making an improvement and seeing them grow. Grow up physically and mentally and spiritually. Yeah. The school system through the day. Yeah, and how, and and you're you're a part of their lives as much as parents yeah, in teach, many ways. I teach PE, so yeah, I see every student every day. Yeah, and, uh, very involved with them from carpool time in the morning to carpool in the afternoon. All right. Well, thank you for watching today, and you pray for our teachers because they need it. And thank you, Jimmy, for all you do. God bless you, man. Yeah, I'll move the chair for you. If you can't make it to the altar, stand behind the kids, or you can come inside the altar and sit, and uh, we'll be praying for you. What would you like to do? Make your way there so we can get started. There you go. Yeah. Lead the way. There, right, we got some leaders here. And we've got students from very small to very old. Well, not very, very old. <laughs> Wyatt's admitting that he is very old, so. He was born old, though. He was an, he's an old soul, as we call him. All right. Now, Roy is going to be praying for you. He is our pastor of student ministries, and so I thought it would be appropriate for him to pray. And don't be disturbed if someone comes behind you and lays a hand on your shoulder or something. That's just some of our staff members making a personal touch that we are praying for you. Now, when we finish praying for you, we're going to be handing out some gifts for you to have to take to school. But we had the discussion, does anybody use rulers in school anymore? Somebody, maybe, probably not math class, maybe art class, or anybody in drafting class, yeah? Well, this ruler is, has a little sign on it that says, let Jesus 
be the ruler of your life. And so, <laughs> Wyatt likes that, so we're good. So anyway, that's our gift to you to remember that we are praying for you. And so uh, let us quiet down as Reverend, as, as Reverend Roy comes to pray. Pray quick. God, I'll tell you what. I just feel like singing right now, you know? I mean, it, no, just pray. Don't sing. Just pray. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the blessings you give us each and every day. And for these students, Lord, I lift them to you. Ask you to bless them in an incredible way. Heavenly Father, may they feel your presence in their life each and every day through the work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, as we begin a new journey, Heavenly Father, this fall, I pray that uh, you will just bless them in an incredible way. May, Lord, as they rekindle some old relationships as well as make new relationships, Lord, I pray that you will be in the midst of each of those relationships that they will make you the centerpiece, Lord, of those relationships as they grow. More important, Heavenly Father, may they sense and know and feel your unconditional love and your walk with them each and every day. And through that, Heavenly Father, know that you have gifted them and, and created them uniquely to be who they are. May they strive to be that, Lord, and grow to reach that potential that you've created for them. And in and through that, let their light shine in a way that reflects you. Lord, now we thank you and praise you for your holy name, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. If the kids, I'm going to, you've got one thing I need you to do. I need you to stand up and face the congregation. Stand up, face the congregation. Now we want all the moms and dads to stand right where you are. All moms and dads, stand up. Grandparents too, if you feel like you're raising them, you can stand up. Now kids, students, we're going to pray for your mom and dad now. So reach out to them with your hand, just like this. Can you see me? There you go. Reach out to them, and let's, I'm going to lead you in prayer. Holy God, bless my mom and dad. Bless my parents and grandparents and those who will help me in school this year. Help them to be very patient with me as sometimes I get a little testy and sometimes when I feel like I can't go on. Lord, help them through this year to help me be a student of Jesus Christ. Praying all this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen. Make sure you get a ruler from one of the staff members and you can return to your seat. Those who are in kindergarten to the second grade are going to go with Miss Lillian to Children's Church. We'll see if it works. Just remember that Jesus is the ruler of your heart. It seems we have some very literally minded students. Uh, why are we getting a ruler? Jesus is the ruler of my heart. All right. Is everybody finding their way back to a seat? Very good. Well, I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is I'm back from vacation. Two glorious weeks hiking in the Adirondacks. So what could be the good news? Rob McGregor has told me that while I was gone, the church in its generosity has called up with a summer budget. Woo, we're gracious. And so Rob McGregor has invited me to go back on vacation so that generosity can continue. I hope he was kidding. I'm here for the long haul. Uh, we did reach, uh, at the very end of the month of July, we caught up with ourselves through the summer slump. And again, that's just an example of some of the great generosity of this congregation. And, and I just wanted to celebrate that with you. I think it's a good thing uh, to know as we get into the thick of ministry of the school year. Uh, again, as Greg Mc, uh, Hatfield has told us, we are a church that never sleeps. Uh, the bright pink insert is your opportunity to join us for our first monthly fellowship supper. Its theme is discipleship. Uh, Dr. Julia Krim and her team will be kind of focusing us on the many opportunities we have to grow in our faith, to mature spiritually. Uh, and 
that's Wednesday, uh, this coming Wednesday night, right? Yes, okay. See, I'm not right all back from vacation. Another ministry is beginning uh, this month that's not new, but it's been kind of in a hiatus for a while, and that is our Augusta University Wesley Foundation. This is a Methodist ministry toward uh, students of different colleges. We've done this before with Greg Hatfield and Scott Parrish, and so we're trying it again. This time the, the student body is a little bigger, and it is a campus where we have dormitories. Uh, our worship leader, Kyle Jones, works hand-in-hand hand with Nicole from Wesley United Methodist Church to begin this process again. Uh, now, as they continue to grow, we're going to come alongside them uh, and form a board of directors. So if you're interested in being a part of that again, uh, uh, Gwen Wood and myself will be a contact person you can get in touch with us, and we'll develop that as we go. Somewhere uh, August 21st will be the week they begin, and we'll try to start meeting there. So that's a new ministry uh, that's coming up, and we're excited about reaching out to them. So with a, a celebration and a thank you, with new ministry starting off, uh, let us continue to be generous so that the ministry of this church will be strong here, there, and everywhere. Ask our ushers to come forward as we pray together. Gracious and holy God, we are indeed overwhelmed by your generosity in our lives, how we are so deeply blessed, not just in material and monetary ways, but also deeply blessed with the traditions of this church and the spirituality of the programs in our ministries. We pray, Father, that not only will you take these gifts, but take our lives and use them to the advancement and the glory of the kingdom of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen.
I have the second best seat in the house to hear this choir sing. You know what the best seat in the house is? In the choir. <laughs> so uh, please notice the front of your bulletin. It is Join a Choir Month. And it's not just the Sanctuary Choir. We have older adult choirs all the way down to our little tykes singing in music. And what I love about this is that we get to teach them not only the, the, the music part of it, but we're also teaching them the words of life, the words of salvation through these songs. And those are kind of things you'll remember in those dark moments of your life, those little songs that keep coming back to you all through life. So take a look at the front of the bulletin, find out where you're going to be in choir, or you're going to have your children's in choir. If you have a question, Danny will be glad to answer them for you. So starting this month, we've got our discipleship with Sunday schools and small groups. We've got our music ministry. All this has to do with discipleship. And the series this month is specifically looking at raising G-rated kids in an X-rated world, but we all need to overhear this conversation. We all need to know what our parents are going through uh, as they raise spiritual children. Um, in the 1980s, it was a little easier to raise children then. Uh, that's when Zig Ziglar wrote a book called Raising Positive Children in a Negative World. Now it's an X-rated world, and it is tough to do. I'm kind of like the guy who said that uh, before he got married, he had no children and six theories on how to raise children properly. Now that he has six children, he has no theories whatsoever. <laughs> Each child needed a different way uh, to understand that. Our scripture this morning uh, all comes from the Old Testament as we have hear the wisdom of raising uh, children, some advice there. The first one from the book of Deuteronomy which is right after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Well, after you give those things, what are you supposed to do with them? And so Moses lays this out uh, as they meet together. I'm going to be reading verse 4 through 7, and then I'm going to jump to Proverbs, a very popular uh, verse there. And we'll use these in our message this morning. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. And then from Proverbs chapter 22, something that I heard often as a child and then often as a parent. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. May the Holy Spirit awaken our curiosity, inspire our understanding, transform our behavior in the reading of this holy word. Back to school preparations. The state even gives you free income tax or free taxes on this one, so you can get things ready. Let's say that you're perfectly finished with all your back-to-school preparations. Let's just say, okay? I know there's probably still a few things you got to do, but I'm going to even put you more in the fantasy world. Let's say you got all the right supplies the first time around. You got everything right. And even the clothes you bought for your children, the kids think they're cool. Isn't that, wouldn't that be great? And you, you got the right school, you got the right classes, you got the right teachers, and even your child is showing an eagerness to study this year. I said it was going to be a fantasy. But just, but just think about, wouldn't that be great to start school off that way? Because now your dreams for your children can come true. Your kid's going to graduate cum laude or better. They're going to get accepted in that right college and take on that great major, that high-powered major, so they can get a job with a Fortune 500 company and pull down six figures in salary and live a comfortable life to a ripe old age where they will die and your job has been done. <sighs> Do you know all that could come true? Every bit of it could come true, and yet your child, in their old age, could still die a lonely and empty life on the inside because they never knew that they had a spiritual side of their life. Only that which was culturally right was emphasized, and we got it all correct, and we were 
we were right there where everybody else was, but there was no sense of spirituality. There was no sense of, of the soul being nurtured, no hint of a living God, no sense of eternity. As I've often talked to you about, usually on Mother's Day and Father's Day, when a parent holds that child that's just come out of the womb in their hands and, and they suddenly realize there's a slice of heaven, a piece of eternity staring them back in the eyes. It, it transforms parents. This week I was reading some articles, had nothing to do with this, this message. In fact, it was, a, it was something I wasn't even looking for. It was an article on altar calls, which I guess it would make sense for a camp meeting. And in this article, there were some Baptist pastors talking back and forth. One of them was saying that in their younger career, they served on staff responsible for young marrieds and their children. He said when he first arrived, he, he kind of got to know everybody and wanted everybody to tell their story. And he said again and again and again and again and again. He said again that many times. <laughs> he said, I kept hearing them talk about their conversion experience where they would come down and give their life to Christ as a child or a teenager. But then they would say, but my life didn't change. And I went off to college and I lived like the world. I sowed my wild oats and prayed for a crop failure, which is an old saying. <laughs> And then I got married, and I had our first child. Finally, I understood this eternity, this divine slice that was given to me, and their lives were committed to Christ. The sermon is about nurturing that soul of a child to see not only that slice of eternity when they're born, but also to see that slice of eternity when they graduate from high school. Wouldn't that be a trip? Now, I know that there are some children who are just naturally spiritual. Uh, I've, I've made this observation through the years as a pastor that some kids very early on understand prayer, they want to read the Bible, they, they love church, and other kids could care less. And, and that disturbed me. And then I realized, you know, some kids are natural baseball players. Some kids are natural musicians and artists and mathematicians. And I began to think, well, some children are naturally gifted. It's, it's a gift from God. But don't let that discourage us as we, we don't compare our children to the best, the very best baseball. Well, maybe we do. <laughs> and that's probably not a good thing. But some kids are gifted. Now, I guess we hope <laughs> that's going to be our child. We won't have to worry about raising our child to, a, to be a spiritual kid because he's going to be born one. Well, for most of us, that's not the way it is. We're going to struggle. And our hope to raise our kids spiritually up against the reality of how difficult that can be, especially in a culture like ours. Several years ago, George Barna did uh, a survey of how parents raise their children. In this survey, he was able to determine that 85% of parents in America believe that they do have the responsibility to raise their children morally and spiritually as they go along in life. But as he pushed the questions in his interview, it was discovered that out of that 85% who believed that that was indeed important, only a third of them actually did it. Whereas two-thirds abdicated that responsibility to the church or to the school. Now, I understand that. Uh, my, my parents took me to church Sunday morning and Sunday night. We had a Sunday night service. It was the only entertainment in town. So we went. We had fun. Wednesday night we were there. But when we got home, there was no spiritual direction in my household. That was something that I discovered later. And, and as I discovered that, it seemed to flow back into my family. And they started to talk about some of the spiritual foundations in their life. George Barna and his surveys made the conclusion that, unfortunately, most families do not have a genuine spiritual life together at home. Now, that's, I'm not here to indict us about this. I'm here to warn us and to then encourage us, to encourage us as we raise, I've, I've called it G-rated kids, but the G is not for general audience. G stands for God. How do we raise God-rated kids? in an X-rated world. The scripture we read from Deuteronomy 
chapter 6, is known as the Jewish Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. This was the phrase that each faithful Jewish person was supposed to repeat twice a day, once in the morning and once before they went to sleep. It was the, the living and the dying, the beginning of the day as well as the end of the day. It was supposed to be that last sentence you spoke on the lips of those who die. And it was supposed to be the first sentence that young children learned as they learned to speak Hebrew. And then it talks about how you're supposed to take these instructions. And in verse 8, it, it even says you ought to tie them on your forehead and, and with a little box and you could put scriptures in it. They took that literally to mean that you put a box on your head and, and you put, put scriptures in them. What it really meant was that these scriptures should be on the forefront of your mind, always in the forefront of your mind as you experience life. But they took it literally. And then that beautiful phrase, as I read in the New International Version, it says, impress these upon your children. Impress these upon your children. Now, these days, that might be seen as a tattoo. I don't know. Uh, I, I, but teaching them diligently, I think, is the better translation. Uh, one translation says, talk to them about it over and over and over again. One translation said, once you've put these scriptures into your inside, then get them inside your children. That means it's not a one-and-done event. It's something that we repeat over and over again. But when do we usually talk to our children about holy things, about godly things? Usually when some disaster happens and we begin to ask the question, why did that happen if God is so good? Or maybe it's a time when there's a death in the family and it was unexpected and, and we're, we're, we're bereaving, we're grieving and children are asking, what happened? Why is this? Now, we really do need to have answers for them, but that shouldn't be the first time we talk about godly things with our children. We should be able to talk about the lovely attributes of God through those normal patches, patches, passages excuse me, of daily living. Part of what it means to raise spiritual kids, to have that conversation. Parents cannot outsource this task of developing spiritual kids. It is parents that God will hold primarily responsible for the training. Now, I want you to put a little star by that statement because I'm going to put another star, a little bit, just a few seconds more, and balance those two out. So, Yes, I believe God is holding parents primarily responsible for this training. Proverbs chapter 22, point your kids in the right direction and when they're old, they won't be lost. I remember hearing that. I thought, well, if I can just point my kids in the right direction, teach them correctly, then I don't have to worry about that. They'll finally get back around. That sometimes doesn't happen. Most Biblical scholars say this is not a hard and fast promise to parents, but it is something which is given to us to give us courage that if we set the training properly in the beginning, then when they get, when they get older and they're lost, there will be something there for them to come back to. I like the way what Roy calls it, sticky faith. Uh, when he teaches the high school students, he says sometimes they don't get it, but we we make it sticky so that it comes back to them when they need it the most. It's a wonderful way of thinking about what you're doing with your young children to help them along the way. Now here's the second little star I want you to put beside you, the, the other statement, that it is a, primarily a parent's responsibility to raise spiritual kids, but at the same time, it is your kid's responsibility to make that faith statement, to make that faith relationship with our holy God through Jesus Christ. Even in the book of Proverbs, which talks about parents training their children in the right direction, talk about these same youth who should guard their souls from the dangers and the snares that are crooked in life. How the youth have to follow not the wicked unto death, but to follow the wisdom of their parents and choose the good paths of righteousness into life. So yes, you are primarily responsible, but in the end, it's, it's the soul, the, the child himself or herself 
America must make that choice and that decision. And here's a third little star for you to put in there. You don't have to do this alone. The church is in partnership with you to help you raise spiritual kids. Now, with that little star, I want to make sure you hear this disclaimer. The church cannot do this alone. This is a dance <laughs> that we have to have a partner to make it work. We have to have a partner, a parent, that helps us un to take home those things which we're teaching them here at church. I, I love the Awana ministry that we have for children on Sunday night because there they have things that they, they memorize scripture, they learn some songs, they do some recreation, they have lots of fun, but then there's things that they have to do at home. Yeah, they call it homework. <laughs> but it involves the parents, and so the church dances with the parents to make sure they're not in this alone. Yes, parents are responsible for the training primarily. Yes, it is the ultimate responsibility of the child to accept that faith for themselves at some point in time. And the church is your partner in doing that. Now, I remember when I was a kid, one of my dad's favorite sayings was, do as I say, not as I do. I got that wrong in the early service and just about got laughed out of the sanctuary. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. My dad was a smoker. He didn't want me to grow up smoking. Uh, he, hated the, he hated it, and he loved it at the same time. And so he would tell me, son, don't do as I do. I mean, don't do as I, I better read this. Do as I say, not as I do. I tried not to do that in my own children's life. I tried to do the part that said, do as I do. Let me show you what being spiritual is about, what it means to have faith in Christ. I don't think our children get to see our parents our, or even the members of the church enough practicing what we preach. I love hearing um, Chris Key talk about her growing up. Uh, her dad was a farmer, and she got to sit in his lap when, she, when he plowed the fields, and he would always stop at the end of the field and, and start naming the birds and talking about the different trees and the plants they were growing and, and God's part in all of that. But you see, in our day and age, we go to offices to go to work. We spend 50 and 60 hours locked away from our families, and we come home, we're too tired. And we don't have that side-by-side -side interaction with our children to teach them the spiritual aspects of life. Sports tries to do that a little bit, but where do they stick the parents? We're up in the bleachers, and some of us are misbehaving up there. <laughs> God, we need time to stand side by side with our children. One of the greatest spiritual developments with my children came when they got into high school. Our church at that time were, do was, were doing uh, ministry through the Appalachian Service Project, a week up in West Virginia, in some parts of Virginia, where we would uh, repair homes, and we had to use a lot of adults. Most of them were parents, and uh, the kids would come up, break them up in teams. And so I found myself taking a week of vacation to eat bad food, to sleep on some bug-infested gym floor that was hard as a rock, but working together with my kids to watch them interacting with the families that we were helping and their children, and for them to see me doing the same thing is it was just invaluable in their lives and my life. Roy has discovered the same thing in the last two summers. Instead of just the kids going off to Memphis, uh, to do a, a mission project together. He's been taking family units to Jamaica. And all oh, the faith development that is happening on those trips is, is amazing to see the depth that parents come back to. So here's just a few things that I would suggest for parents. And you get to overhear this congregation that have already raised your kids. Maybe you have got grandkids or uh, nieces and nephews that you could perhaps do some of these same things with them alongside their parents. But first of all is make sure you have the talk. Not just the talk, but a talk. Several discussions along the way about spiritual matters. Talk with each other about what the preacher said. I call this taking the preacher to lunch without actually having him show up. What did he say today? Uh, I, I love the way Jennifer did that with her kids. You know, did you hear what the preacher said? And boy, they would say, yeah, we did. 
Have a discussion with what's happening at church. Use everyday occurrences like the tree dying in the backyard and that sucker tree coming up in its roots. What is that about in the tree of in the in the life cycle of nature? Springtime, wintertime, a visit from grandparents, puppies born. Use these as opportunities to talk about the creation of God and how God loves his people and sent his son Jesus Christ. It just it will naturally lead into that. Second, your children need to hear you speak about your own spiritual journey. Now, this doesn't have to be uh, a long uh, biblical uh, and theological uh, conversation. In fact, it shouldn't be. It should simply be from what happened in your heart. And maybe it's not that it's all that great, but it's your story. And it's your, you're the, your kid's parents, and he or she will appreciate hearing that. Thirdly, families need to pray together at times other than just the quick grace at meal. That prayer when a kid goes down to sleep, or at least the first attempt when they go down to sleep, uh, to pray with them there, to pray with them when they are awake in the morning. Uh, Connie and I always enjoyed that time as we began a, a, a long vacation or a long weekend. We would start off in the car with prayer to protect us for safety, to give us a, a, a new experience. Praying at times when school is difficult, when Daniel had a bully after him one particular season, Connie used that as a, an opportunity to pray for your enemies. That's a powerful lesson. Fourthly, read the Bible with your children. Use appropriate translations so they can understand. Don't read it so long that they you know, fall out on you. Just read this short text and make it a part of remembering it the night before the next night and for goodness sakes go to church together be a part of the ministries and the programs we're prepared to dance with parents from youngest of children's all the way up through college age but if you're not here we can't dance with you finally be positive and encouraging in your faith no child wants to be a part of something that's negative and destructive so discover the part of your faith in God that's positive and encouraging and share that with them and tell your child how that's growing in your life. Whether it be a slow growth or a fast growth, they just need to hear that you understand that there's a spiritual side of life. And so when you held that child and you discovered there is a piece of eternity, a slice of divinity right there in your hands, and it melted your heart and your soul, it made you recommit to church and to God and Christ. Well, at 18, I want you to have that same feeling. And so, whatever you need to do to do that, make it happen. If you need to get your own life and relationship with God squared away, do it, and do it today. If you need to get the handle on some personal issues or bad habits, do it and do it today. Do it now. If you need to get your job in balance with your family, do it and do it today. If you need to get some help for yourself so that you can see the love of God, do it today. Little eyes are watching you. And if you have teenagers in your family, leering eyes are watching you. <laughs> But those leering eyes, you know, they look like their attitude, you know, they just soon see you melt away. They're taking notes. And even as you share positive, encouraging parts of your faith, they'll remember. And as you raise your children up in the ways of the Lord, when they lose their way, there'll be something sticky in their soul that they'll remember where to come to. Because there are many, many things that you can give your children. Every single one of them will fade or rust or be lost by your children. There's only one gift that will never fade that will last for eternity. And that's raising a spiritual kid who is a disciple and follower of Jesus Christ. And so we pray and we partner with you to raise a spiritual kid in an X-rated culture. Let me pray for our parents. Holy God in heaven, as we begin this school year, a lot of things have had to happen, and some of us are even overwhelmed already. 
We pray for moms and dads, for uncles and aunts and grandparents and neighbors who are going to take part in the raising of these children. We pray that we will understand that it's not all about education and it's not all about physical strength, that it also includes the soul of this child. And we pray, dear God, that you would help us to raise our children as spiritual children, that they find trust in Jesus Christ, to follow him in this world of confusion. Oh, Lord. May we all be strong as a church, as a community, and as parents to raise spiritual kids in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. This has been the worship service from Trinity on the Hill United Methodist Church, a production of Trinity Methodist Television, as an outreach ministry to those of the Augusta area. If you found this to be a meaningful service, let us hear from you by calling 738 738- 8822 or writing Trinity on the Hill, 1330 Montesano Avenue, Augusta, Georgia, 30904.